Well, I'm Dan Rundy. I hold the Schreier Chair here at CSIS. This is a topic that's particularly close to my heart. Um, uh, but before I start, I want to welcome my friend uh, Paul Wolfowitz, who's here as former president of the World Bank, for being with us. There are also a number of folks who are involved with the doing business work who are here, uh, World Bank staffers. There's also a panel that I'll talk about briefly as well, who I think are also here. I think this is a consequential meeting, and I think this is going to be a consequential program. Uh, the World Bank's most successful program, Doing Business, ranks countries on the ease of starting and running a formal business. It has helped spark major free market reforms in over 100 countries during its 10 years of existence. Doing Business ranks countries by how hard or easy it is to start a formal, meaning tax-paying, bank loan-taking business. In many countries, setting up a business by the book can cost tens of thousands of dollars and conceivably years of fighting red tape. Operating in an informal economy is bad for prosperity. No access to bank loans, many opportunities for bribes, and less folks paying any taxes at all. The fact that the World Bank releases an annual ranking gives doing business power and influence in unique ways because of the bank's pull in developing countries. Uh, a small number of vocal countries on the board of the World Bank dislike where they end up on the doing business rankings. As a result, they've called on bank management to change the methodology of the report to reflect aspects that they can perform more highly on and to stop ranking countries according to the ease of doing business. In addition, several quarters are calling for the World Bank Group to give doing business project to another institution. A very bad idea. Doing business is carried out each year without large foreign aid payments. Doing business, frankly, reflects a broadly American and widely accepted view about development, not just an American view, but a widely, more internationally, widely accepted view about development, that the private sector is the main driver of development. Doing business was incubated with very strong port from the support from the United States of America. Uh, the, some of the methodology comes from USAID. This is something that came from the 80s and 90s in USAID. It was one of two branches of, of influence in terms of how the methodology was put together. It was supported by the Bush administration through funding, through technical support, and political cover. And then a lot of brave and smart people in the World Bank, uh, serious economists and technical leaders in development, provided both the technical leadership to make it happen and also the bureaucratic political support, because there are forces within the World Bank itself that dislike uh, doing business, now, either for uh, ideological reasons or out of, frankly, professional jealousy. It is the most successful and most widely followed piece of the World Bank. And in a world where ODA matters less and knowledge and ideas matters more, and if the World Bank is supposed to be the knowledge bank, the power of the World Bank's research and the power of the World Bank's imprimatur matters. So outsourcing this is a very, very bad idea. Killing or crippling this is a very, very bad idea. Uh, Jim Kim became president in July of 2012, and with his ascent, anti-reform forces within the bank's bureaucracy and on its board sensed their chance to kill, cripple, or outsource this index. After a messy board meeting last summer where no consensus was released, Jim Kim punted and convened the DBR panel, the Doing Business Review panel, dbrpanel.org. Take a look to review doing business. That panel is expected to release a recommendation about the fate of doing business by June of 2013. At a time when the Obama administration and development thought leaders speak about the importance of funding activities that are evidence-based and data-driven, doing business is, has a mountain of evidence and a mountain of data. We have two of some of the, the greatest hits of papers, one by one of my friends, Leora Clapper, um, about entry regulation as a barrier to entrepreneurship, completely driven off of the doing business metrics. There's another, a policy research working paper, License to Sell, the Effect of Business Registration Reform on Entrepreneurial Activity in Mexico. Again, a World Bank paper. So evidence-based and data-driven. I get, I get this drilled into my head every day by development thought leaders and by people uh, who lead development organizations in the United States and in the international arena every single day. If we believe that, let's walk our talk. Let's back it up. So I find it very, very strange that we're even having this discussion of, of questioning the validity of doing business, that we're questioning the methodology, or that we're questioning outsourcing this. It's, uh, and frankly, it's borderline outrageous. Um, the United States was asked two years ago at a time of fiscal austerity to support the general capital increase of the World Bank. As a result of that, we would retain a big seat at the table and exercise influence with 
the World Bank management and its allied shareholders in, in favor of things like strengthening doing business. The United States renewed its commitment to the World Bank through the general capital increase, and it's time for the World Bank to renew its commitment to a proven program that supports free markets, cuts regulation, increases government revenues to pay for public services that we all care about, and empower entrepreneurs. Killing, crippling, or outsourcing the index to another institution is one of the worst things the World Bank could possibly do and would be a direct rebuke to all those that have supported the general capital increase, uh, whether in the United States or in other countries as well. Let me, um, I'm going to stop there. We have two very distinguished speakers um, who are going to be speaking about the doing business work. My fir the first speaker I've asked is Juan Jose Daboob, who is the former finance minister of El Salvador. He's a former managing director as well at the World Bank, so he can speak to it from both sides of this conversation. Juan Jose is a very good friend, and it's a real pleasure to have Juan Jose here. Juan Jose, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Dan, uh, for the invitation. I think this is indeed a very important topic. I see a lot of friends. Good morning, Paul, my former boss and good friend. Um, I have spent about one third of my life in academia, one third of my life in the private sector, and one third of my life in the public sector. Uh, my family owns several businesses throughout Latin America. I have some businesses here in the United States. I'm in the board of directors of several companies here in the United States, in the Middle East, and in Latin America. I have taught at Princeton, and I was for 12 years uh, uh, in government in El Salvador without belonging to any political party. In those 12 years, working for three different administrations, uh, we were able, El Salvador was able to go from hardship to investment grade. That was possible because the leadership of the country was able to convince and persuade the constituency, as well as Congress and other organizations within the country, to move in a particular direction. The one we chose was to follow a similar model to the one that Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, Ireland, Chile, uh, and a few other countries had followed, which had to do with opening up their economy, strengthening their, their uh, governance uh, structure, and empower people to take destiny into their own hands. We were able to do it. One of the tools that I personally use many, many times to persuade politicians that this was an important set of reforms to do was uh, a, a matrix like the Doing Business Report. Uh, there were other tools, there are other tools also available, the Index of Economic Freedom, the Competitiveness Indicator, but the Doing Business Report uh, has uh, some additional values because of the source that is uh, actually uh, producing it. So whenever we wanted to reform, say, the telecommunication sector, the uh, power sector, uh, doing a pension reform, or at the end, which was the last uh, uh, thing I was involved in, which was dollarizing the economy in order to fully integrate El Salvador to the worldwide economy, uh, we were touching the nationalistic fiber of the politicians who had to vote for these laws by showing them how other countries were beating us. You know, the Doing Business Report is not a thermometer that tells you what the temperature is. There, is n there are no exact tools that can provide that kind of information. It is a navigation chart that helps you move in the right direction, that helps you enable the environment to attract investments from the private sector, which ultimately create the real jobs that people want in countries like El Salvador. When I joined the bank, I found already in 2006 the environment that uh, uh, Dan just uh, described to us, an environment where certain countries, especially, believe it or not, from Europe, well, I do believe it because when you see are they're close to socialist system they have, they are afraid of competing and of uh, doing the reforms they have to do, and therefore tools like these are not necessarily the most attractive, again, to some countries. And we also have some other countries from other countries yet developing countries that were in very difficult conditions from countries in Africa, 
in Latin America, Asia, or the Middle East were actually very uh, happy and very uh, encouraged to use a tool like the Doing Business Report to help them make some of the decisions they needed to make in order to come out of their very difficult situations to an extent following the example that at the time I was in government, we, we had to do. So during those years, I was a managing director at the World Bank, again, responsible for Africa, the Middle East, Asia, and Latin America. I saw people, and there are a few of you sitting around here, there is the former minister of uh, 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 finance from Lebanon here who can also testify to this. Uh, there are many other people who I know use the doing business as a fantastic tool to convince sometimes the president of the country, many times to convince parliament or Congress, and often to also work with civil society and the private sector on precisely enabling the environment to uh, attract the investments that are needed in those countries. Those debates that were already taking place at that time were overcome because there was a firm and clear leadership at the helmet of the organization first in the hands of Paul Wolfowitz, then with Bob Selleck, both of whom were always very, very supportive of the doing business. So part of my message here is, whether you come from the private sector, from academia, or from civil society, whether you are in multilateral organizations, you do research, you are in a think tank, in a do tank, you are in Transparency International or in other organizations, this is the kind of tool that helps enhance the dialogue and the conversation among the different stakeholders in a society. And even though it's not perfect, like, just like no index is perfect, it is a fantastic tool to follow. It is a fantastic way of observing progress. It is a fantastic way to also see when we deviate from a particular goal or objective. So when I finish at the World Bank in 2010, my four-year mandate, Guess what? I started a foundation that deals with issues related to climate change, the adaptation side of climate change. And guess what? The first thing we developed was a matrix, an index that is called the Global Adaptation Index. The Global Adaptation Index was literally moved into Notre Dame University that yesterday at 12 at the press club, we pass on the baton to Notre Dame. The Global Adaptation Index has two sets of data. On vulnerability, we take data from the ground that measures access to water, energy, coastal protection, etc. And on the x-axis, we are measuring readiness, which means how enable is the environment to attract investments to reduce vulnerabilities for people in need. That index, those matrix come from information of the doing business, as disclaimed in the website, and it has a 0 .9, 0 0.9 correlation with the doing business report. So developing matrix like this is important for developing countries, for developed countries who want to take their countries to the next stage. The leadership within the, within the bank needs to understand this, needs to take it into their own hands, and avoid the risk of diluting it or moving it away from our organization that sometimes don't have too many things to show for, while well, the doing business is one that should make it proud and therefore it shouldn't lose it. Otherwise, it will just become one more organization out there like the many that are out there that very seldom achieve goals and objectives. Thank you very much. Juan Jose, let me just take, let me ask you one question. It's a little bit of a leading question. Then I might ask uh, former President Wolfowitz perhaps to respond to the same question since we have, we're lucky to have him here with us today. Okay, so you're the president of the World Bank and you're presented with several vocal minority folks on your board, perhaps some, some effective senior level bureaucrats that may question the methodology and are playing, you know, saying I don't like this methodology or several vocal and large, medium-sized developing countries to say, I don't like this. If you're the president of the World Bank, how do you manage that when you have a non-consensus on the board? How, how do you lead the organization? If you could just, how, what would be your response to that if you were presented with a situation like that on, your, on, on the board? Uh, 
And I'll maybe ask President Wolfowitz to yeah. say the same well, thing. Well, it's very hard to be in someone else's shoes, but uh, my first response is that that is the first test they are putting to the president of the World Bank. And he can decide to leave the World Bank with good ideas and great products or give away his leadership to lots of other people within the organization. And therefore, that will be uh, a lost opportunity. So our first as by this defended, protected, enhance it, make it even better. Uh, uh, otherwise, you are giving up uh, your authority and your power I in what has proven to be a very useful tool. Thank you very much. President Wolf, was perhaps maybe if you were presented with a messy board meeting, maybe not a full consensus, you had several vociferous shareholders who said, I don't, I don't like this methodology, uh, I don't like how I rank, or I think it's an incomplete ranking or it's an imperfect ranking, and you had senior people, perhaps vice president level folks or directors come to you and say, oh, it's, this, is, this is an imperfect measure, it doesn't complete. What, what was your response then and what would your advice be to President Kim in terms of how to lead the bank now? I'll give you the floor. Well, I guess, first of all, what I would say is um, this is a tool that does no harm, it only does good. Uh, Certain European countries, and I guess it's better not to name names here, uh, certain very successful Asian economies, not to name names, don't like where they're ranked. Well, big deal. It doesn't make any difference. This tool is not used to allocate bank resources. There's a sort of phony one called, uh, remind me what it is, it has a GPIA, which is supposed to allocate um, uh, IDA resources no one understands the formula, so it, you can do whatever you want with it. This is transparent, by the way, and I've had experience of talking to presidents of countries uh, who were struggling, struggling a good deal more than, than France or China struggle, uh, and told them how bad their ranking was. And I expected to get an argument about, oh, your methodology is all wrong. I got the exactly opposite reaction. They went back home and changed how they perform. And it, for countries that are successful to say we want to take this tool away from countries that are struggling and are trying to get out from excessive regulation, it's really tragic. And I would add to the tragedy of it all, as I think you point out in some of your literature, one of the results of these hyper-regulated economies is not only that they do badly, but that huge fractions of their labor force work in the euphemistically called informal economy and even larger fractions of the female working force, which means they're working outside of whatever limited protection these lousy regulations are supposed to provide them. Uh, the notion that somehow labor conditions will be improved if 80% of the, if only 20% of the labor force works under the regulations and the other 80% are working in an illegal economy is, is backwards logic. And it, I, I just find it as, well, I don't find it astonishing. Unfortunately, even back then, I could sense the resistance. But the answer to your question is, I think the president of the bank has enormous discretion in these matters. Uh, we had a rather bloody fight over whether Republic of Congo Brazzaville, which is a significant oil producer, uh, where 70% of the population lives in poverty while the president of the country spends, I think it was $6,000 a night on his hotel room in New York, you would have thought that putting some conditions on debt relief for the Republic of Congo uh, would have been what in English we call a no-brainer, but in French it translates into something apparently the opposite. <laughs> and at one point, the, the French member of the board trying to railroad through his proposition said, I think he had the numbers right, that 22 of the 24 board members support our position. And I said, well, that's fine, but you can't make motions, only the president can, and I'm not going to move for debt relief until we have a solution here that is satisfactory uh, to some kind of minimal standard. The issue was whether they would have to submit their oil revenues to some kind of impartial audit for more than a year. <laughs> you would, again, as I say, I don't know what the word is in French, but in English it's seemed pretty obvious to me. But the president has that kind of authority. Uh, I don't think they ever forgave me for doing that one. But this is not controversial. It shouldn't be controversial. And I think it rests on the principle of transparency. If people could see the light of day on this one, I think the, the people who are trying to undermine it would have to run away, I hope. Thanks very much, Paul. Thank you very much. I, my friend and colleague, Simon Jankov, has not joined us yet, so I'm going to call a little bit of an audible, and we're going to go to the next panel. 
Juan Jose, thank you very much. Paul, thank you very much for that. Really appreciate it. Please thank, uh, thank Juan Jose. for. Thank you very much. We're going to call the panel up. Paul, Randy, Randy, if you would, and uh, Andrew, we're going to go ahead and start with the panel. I'm calling an audible. Okay. So this, this panel is going to be from policymakers, development practitioners, development advocates. We're going to have a second panel talking about methodology and from economists. But I think this is a panel about looking back and looking at how pre, who, these were folks who were present at the creation, and these are folks that have followed the issue since in a variety of ways. So I'm going to hand the floor over to my very able colleague, uh, Joanna Nessa Tuttle, who's our Senior Vice President for Strategic Planning and the Co-Director of the U.S. Leadership and Development Project here at CSIS. Joanna. Good morning. Thanks, Dan. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm really happy to be here with this um, incredible set of people to talk about sort of the genesis of the Doing Business Report. I want to give you a little bit of context before I introduce our folks today. Um, as Dan said, we've just released a major report here at CSIS uh, called Our Shared Opportunity, A Vision for Global Prosperity. This is a major partnership we've had underway with Chevron. We have spent two years doing research, looking at uh, working groups, reports, events, discussions. And we spent the past year with a large council, of which Andrew Natsios was a part. And the group came out uh, with a message that was quite concrete and strong. They said, look, we need to really focus on broad-based economic growth as a core part and a fundamental uh, starting point of our development activities. And we need, we need the private sector engaged in that. And we need to look at trade and investment as really vital parts of our development toolkit. We need to use them more creatively and effectively. Um, so we did talk about the Doing Business Report as part of this, and we talked about the importance of some of the, um, some of the policy changes and the policy landscape in developing countries as, as a vital, um, sort of a b vital impact on the level of investment and the type of investment that's going to flow into countries. So the Doing Business Report um, kind of kept popping up over and over. So we want to talk about it in that broad context. I actually personally have to say I, I find it surprising that it's only 10 years old because it seems like it's had an outsized impact. It is a name brand that's kind of known wherever you talk about it. And it seems like its impact has been uh, more durable than 10 years worth. Uh, but it really has been 10 years. And so we've got with us here today a group of people, two of whom were really present at the beginning. So we want to talk about what spawned the report, what was the thinking at the beginning, why was this undertaken. Um, Andrew Natsios was the AID administrator at the time that this was getting underway. And we're going to ask him to talk a little bit about the genesis and what, where AID was and the U.S. government was on the thinking. Uh, Randy Quarles has been, he served in various roles, but Under Secretary of the Treasury, Assistant Secretary of the Treasury, and he was also the, um, he was the executive director, I'm going to just make sure I get this right, executive director of the IMF uh, and really working on helping to stand up the report. So in terms of the context, the policy environment in which this was created, we want to hear their thinking. And then Paul O'Brien is with Oxfam America and uh, has spent a lot of time on the ground in developing countries looking at how do you, how do you uh, motivate development and get it moving. So we want to ask him from his perspective and from the NGO perspective, practically, how, how do these, how do these uh, activities and these rankings actually take hold or um, resonate in developing countries? And maybe what, what is sort of his perception, the perception of his colleagues in some of the NGO communities? So we're going to start with you, Andrew Natsios, uh, and just ask you, just talk a little bit about the genesis and your thinking about where this, uh, where this set of activities fits in the development landscape. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a complex and long topic, but let me just mention that when I got to AID, there was not a lot of focus on economic growth. Uh, there was attacks going on against the Washington Consensus. Joseph Stiglitz wrote his book on uh, globalization and its discontents. So in this 80s, there was the, uh, the Washington Consensus. Then there was a whole reaction against it, against the liberal international economy, uh, not just demonstrations, but books being written. Uh, and, and it seems to me, what was being lost was the question of how do we get growth, because equitable growth is the most important factor in reducing poverty. It's important to improve social services, but you can be uh, well-educated and uh, get all your shots and have clean water and starve to death because the economy doesn't produce any food 
and there were there are certain countries we're seeing that right now. And North Korea, for example, was an advanced economy in a communist sense, but it's now a complete wreck, and its population continues to starve because of the economic system. We look to two sources for how to do that. Clearly, we're not going to, we don't, we got rid of all our macroeconomists in the 1990s, which I think was a disaster in AID. We, I, I didn't realize the role AID played in the early 80s. Uh, some of the major economists who developed the ma ma macro economy were, were part of AID, and AID sponsored a whole set of books being written that were critical, sort of a neoclassical approach to uh, economics in the early 80s under Peter McPherson. I didn't know this until I left office. <laughs> um, what, what we look to is Michael Porter at the Harvard Business School and his books on competitiveness. And secondly, we started looking what the World Bank was doing. And I met Simeon Jankov, and we invited Simeon Jankov to come each year. He would produce the Doing Business Report to give a lecture to the entire senior staff. Now, everybody had to listen to the lecture. There were like 70 people in the room. We had a meeting once a week. 90% of the people were career officers. And of course, I had packed in a bunch of economists who had hidden when they were doing the layoffs in the 90s. They changed their... Uh, titles. Agriculturalists were laid off, education specialists and economists were, so they changed it to development specialists. <laughs> I, I found 40 agricultural economists who simply dropped the word economists and they became experts in microfinance to save themselves from the purges that went on. Um, and these people I, I promoted and Simeon became a friend of mine. When I went to Georgetown to teach, I brought him to teach my classes and he told the stories that he never told in front of AID as to the political opposition in the bank. It wasn't, it was the macroeconomists. There were macroeconomists in the bank who refused to accept that microeconomics had anything to do with growth. Now I asked one of the people who designed, who's in his 80s at the time, 10 years ago, I said, why didn't you do this stuff? It's not part, if you read the Nashi consensus, this is not part of it. And he said, Andrew, the, the, the scholarly literature on what we did is incomplete. This was always, the rule of law was always part of it. Business law was part of it. And it never made its way in the literature. And we sort of stopped making the changes. And so there's this, this broad attack against a Washington uh, consensus, which is in fact a, 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 a straw man. It's not what was actually discussed by the architects themselves. So we had them every, and then we started, I said, you know, if the bank's going to resist this, Simeon is under attack constantly by the board. We know what's going on. It's in a, they, say, they see the doing business report as an attack on the Napoleonic Code. And for national pride reasons, which is, I think, is the stupidest thing I have ever seen in the World Bank, that people would make policy, well, I shouldn't say stupidest because it's very common. All countries behave, you know, they have national pride, but to, 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 uh, restrain or to um, condition reform because of language or some legal code that was written 200 years ago, I find it very bizarre, but that's what happened. The French opposition was not based on economics. It was based on the fact that this argued that the common law tradition was more uh, conducive to economic growth than the Napoleonic Code was. I, I you know, it's, it's true, and I can, it's, there's a reason why. There's a reason why. That's not the purpose of this. But anyway, we started putting money aside to fund doing business reports, because many developing countries on their own came to us and said, how are we going to do this, Andrew? I, I had heads of state all over Africa saying, we read it, we don't like where we are, we don't know how to change this, can you please, and I know this is another thing, no one likes technical assistance. Sometimes technical assistance is very useful. It is very useful. And we can show in, in many countries where uh, the heads of state and the finance minister and, and the minister of investment would come to us and say, how are we going to make the changes? And we would send in a teams of, of technical people to help them rewrite their regulations. And I have to say, most of the regulations in the doing business, Paul's right. It's not, the, the, you can argue against the Washington consensus. It had a negative side to it in some cases, the way it was administered. How is having it, how, how is it damaging to change the legal system so you don't have to wait seven years to settle a case? In what legal system is it desirable to wait seven years to settle a commercial law case? In what legal system is it a good idea for a poor country to charge $4,000 for a new business to start? which was what the cost was in Ethiopia. I met with Melis Sinawi for seven hours, and I said, Otto Melis, he's a friend of mine. I don't, don't agree with everything he's done, 
but he was serious about it as a development fresh. He wrote books on it before his death. And I said, you know, you have one of the, he said, we're advancing. I said, you've had a 50% drop in your economic uh, uh, per capita income since you took over. I, I don't, you know, you're, you're one of the poorest countries in the world. You keep having food emergencies every two years. We bail you out. This is not going to work. You've got to do something to make some changes. And he didn't agree to everything, but he agreed to a lot. And when I showed him how much it costs us to do a business, to start a business, he, he, he was shocked. And I said, I said, I asked the AID staff why this is. I'm just telling you the story. We don't know for sure. Someone put in the regulations that you had to have an ad this big in one of the large newspapers to start a new business. So if a shoeshine boy wanted a permit to do shoeshine or a little a souvenir shop, they had to put, and the, the, the cost of it was $4,000. Now I said, who would write a regulation like that? Apparently, someone's brother owned the newspaper. So my last point here is, What's very clear in the latest literature, latest debate on economic growth is that Douglas North and Violence and Social Orders, his new book, it's not new anymore, but, and then Asimoglu and Robbins's wonderful new book on why nations fail, have pointed out that we can't just have economists running this. And I'm not attacking economists, I think we need them and all that, but we need some people who understand political economy and the politics of elites controlling the economy. That's what this is about. Over a set of decades, Rules have been put in place to protect monopolistic and oligopolistic control over the economy by elites who control a political system. And the Doing Business Reports attempts to loosen those controls that the elites have. That's what this is about. And when you have a serious head of state like, uh, like Mellis in Ethiopia, when, he's point, when he, you show him how there's no downside to reducing from $4,000 to $150, which, by the way, is the cost of starting a new business in Canada and the United States or Singapore. What's the downside on that? What, what is the damage to society? I mean, I don't understand this. Some of the rules you can argue against, one or two, but the rest of them, there is no downside to it. Why this is now being questioned at the World Bank, I, I think it's deplorable, to be very frank with you. I, and I think what Simeon went through when he was at the bank is even more deplorable. People should put their egos aside and their culture aside and at least think about what's going to happen to poor people, because that's what this is supposed to be all about. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Randy, I'm going to switch to you next and ask you to talk about what was happening, you know, from, from your perspective at that time. Button. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, just a few comments. Um, uh, so, at the time that the uh, Doing Business Project started in 2002 and the first report came out, uh, so at that time, my responsibilities at the Treasury sort of involved the relationship with the IFES and the World Bank, thinking about development policy, among other things. Um, I would, you know, I would obviously like to say that the Treasury had a large role in pushing for the Doing Business Project, but we really didn't. Um, that was something that uh, came out of another set of processes, but we wholeheartedly supported it at the time. And why was that? Uh, the reasons are, you know, are actually pretty obvious. Uh, first, uh, private sector growth is essential for developing countries to improve living standards. All the official assistance in the world is not really, it's important, it's helpful, it's not really going to make a dent in the fundamental problem unless you have a vibrant, growing private sector. China's shown us that. Um, the second point, again, this is almost embarrassingly obvious. I'm a little embarrassed to say that this was the Treasury's thinking because it's so obvious. <laughs> but uh, making it easier for people in countries to start new businesses is good for growth. Growth is essential. Starting, a bu starting businesses is good for growth. It's, it's obvious. Equally important, Inefficient regulation victimizes the most vulnerable people in any jurisdiction. Uh, it's the whole essence of cronyism. Cronyism is impossible without a system of heavy and inefficient regulation, and the people who will suffer most are the people 
who are least able to suffer. Uh, President Wolfowitz was a great champion of the Doing Business uh, Report and the Doing Business Project when he was uh, president. But this is something that has been uh, accepted and championed by a range of World Bank presidents. Jim Wolfenson uh, was obviously the World Bank president at the time that this started. And at the time of the second uh, Doing Business Report, he said, many countries aspire to protecting the poor, but it's a myth that heavy bureaucratic regulations achieve this goal. Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Finland are all on our list of the 20 countries with the simpl simplest business regulation because they regulate where it counts. They protect property rights, they provide social services, and they've found that workers, investors, and even the tax authorities can all be looked after without reams of red tape. Uh, fourth, uh, we really liked, and I, I particularly liked at the Treasury, the fact that the Doing Business Report and the Doing Business Project involved everybody. So one of the other things that, uh, that was happening sort of more on the IMF side, also, on the, uh, also involving the World Bank, was the so-called FSAP process, the, the global assessments of financial sectors, uh, in which the U.S. steadfastly refused to participate, uh, largely thanks to reluctance on the part of the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve just said, look, this will be a waste of our time. We had set up a global system uh, for the IFEs to, to assess uh, the financial sector regulation in countries around the world, and we said, that's for others. And what was enormously, and th that rankled me, and obviously <coughs> it proved out that perhaps we could have benefited from someone checking our financial sector regulation, but, the, uh, 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 but what was enormously appealing about the Doing Business Project was that it applied to everybody. All members of the World Bank would be assessed uh, and all members would participate. Uh, and a last, but the fact that it's last, it's also kind of obvious, uh, but it's not quite as obvious as the others, and was perhaps what was most appealing to me about the Doing Business Project and the role of the Doing Business Report. Uh, somehow, I have spent a lot of my uh, life as a policymaker, although I think of myself as a private sector person. And the successful policy efforts that I have been part of had two key characteristics. So one, they had their genesis in careful, nuanced, and detailed analyses, comprehensive work that provided a solid intellectual framework for approaching whatever the policy issue in question was. Uh, and the concepts behind the Doing Business Report had that. They had that in the work of Simeon Jankov, Andrei Schlieffer, and, and they have been supported by the work of a raft of economists since then, including, as, uh, uh, as Andrew just mentioned, uh, Asimoglu and Robinson, Robertson's uh, latest book. There is a wealth of careful, nuanced, detailed, intellectual work behind the concepts of the Doing Business Report. But the second thing that is important in any policy project that's actually going to make a difference anywhere outside the academy is that that nuanced discussion needs to be condensed into a handful of principles that are simple to understand. They are inevitably, inevitably they elide over questions because you can't keep everything in your head all at once, but a policy process that's actually going to change anything has to be assimilable by a vast array of interests, a vast array of people. And, and when we're talking about development, we're talking about interests in people all over the world across a huge range of cultures. And the great thing about the Doing Business Report was that it condensed this intellectual framework into a set of principles that you know, one can tweak, one can uh, you know, improve, they have changed over time, <laughs> but that they were assimilable and they were able to be hammered home over and over and over again. And there is no policy effort that I've ever been part of, whether domestically, internationally, whether on the financial structure side, whether on the development side, uh, that, has, uh, that hasn't had both parts. And what we liked about this was that it had both parts. It wasn't just a list of principles. It had this wealth of, of uh, intellectual support behind it, but it wasn't just a, uh, a wealth of intellectual support in complicated papers without a set of, without a tool that could be actionable. So 
Um, let me end, let me just uh, end by talking about uh, now, back in the private sector and as an investor, how we think about uh, uh, the principles behind the report. Uh, so as an investor, I'm making decisions on the allocation of capital in a lot of jurisdictions around the world. And the threshold question for any investor looking at an opportunity outside his home jurisdiction, the one that he knows the best, is what is the investment climate? And while there are a lot of factors behind the 10 specific uh, uh, elements that are examined in the Doing Business Report that are relevant to the investment climate, uh, I mean, there are factors that are beyond you know, all of regulation that are relevant to the investment climate, still the regulatory obstacles to business, and in particular, the specific factors in the Doing Business Report are fundamental. Now, now don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that you know, the investors in private equity firms and, and banks around the world are sort of taking the Doing Business Report and kind of drawing a line, well, I'm not going to invest anywhere that's under 86. You know, um, uh, real world investors aren't using it as a tool in that sense. But it is not just an academic or an aesthetic undertaking. The factors that are measured by the report matter. And the effect that the report has of getting countries to improve their performance on those factors matters to real world decisions about where capital is allocated. So um, uh, let me end by saying that, you know, as everyone knows, these reports have become among the most important regular publications of the bank. Uh, they have become, in a short period of time, uh, as Jan has noted, flagship uh, publications of the bank. Uh, really uh, almost the same level as the World Development Report, but with a different style and a different role. And given that style, uh, the doing business rankings are always going to be uncomfortable for every participant, except maybe Singapore. Um, <laughs> but unless they were uncomfortable, they couldn't fill their role in the policy process. Their role is not to be the intellectual underpinning. Their role is to be the action tool. Uh, and they've enjoyed the support of, World Bank, of a range of World Bank presidents. They have uh, a huge amount of uh, academic underpinning. Uh, people with a range of policy views uh, who have found themselves agreed on the usefulness of a simple tool to focus attention on regulatory obstacles to business. Um, I think it would be unusual for any organization, public or private, uh, World Bank or, or uh, not, to take what has, in a short period of time, what its consumers have voted with their feet to show is among the most useful things they do, and to abandon it. That would be a peculiar thing for any organization to do. Uh, I hope that after the decade of work that's gone into it, we're not deprived of it. Great, thank you. Um, Paul, I'm going to turn to you and ask you to give your perspective here and uh, maybe add a little color commentary. Randy, I'm going to ask you to press your button again. To turn your button, Paul. Okay. All right. So I think it was uh, Oscar Wilde who said the only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about. <laughs> and I want to congratulate Dan because I think this is the right conversation at the right time. And I worry that the, what will do the most damage over the next year will be benign neglect of this discussion. So. Uh, strategic kudos to you, Dan. Thanks for uh, bringing this together, and it's been great to hear the commentary so far, and I'd like to respond to some of it in some ways, but in the main, I agree with it. Let me start with this observation. Oxfam, this, I, we're hosting, uh, this happens for the spring meetings. I think we have more than a dozen folks in town uh, to help influence the World Bank. That's, that's a big investment of time and resources for an organization like ours, but they're not talking about doing business that much. Full agenda, meeting with the EDs and uh, ministers of finance of different countries, pushing various agenda items, but not this. And I, obviously, coming to this discussion, was curious as to why and talked to colleagues about where we stood. And I, I got a range of views, but in the main, I came away with the sense that the challenge from a civil society perspective for the doing business discussion is its danger of being an orphan. And I want to talk about being an orphan in two ways that I think may be useful for future discussion. One is being a passion orphan, right? So folks in my organization uh, cluster around the water cooler and start shouting at each other, hopefully in good ways. <laughs> For two, in two different kinds of ways. One, we've got the love-based crowd who 
came to development because of the human connection thing. There's somebody out there they want to be relevant to, they're passionately motivated by it, and they want to have a conversation about connecting to those particular individuals who are suffering. They, 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 they may not label themselves this way, but they're basically love-based. And the other folks who gather around the cooler are the justice-based, our rights-based gang. They get there because of a profound anger about somebody who's doing something really wrong, and they want to see that wrong corrected. So you've got the rights-based gang or justice-based gang on the one hand, and you've got the love-based gang on the other hand, and where does doing business get a hearing? Not well from either side of that equation, precisely because of a choice it made. So that's one challenge it faces from the civil society perspective. Here's the other one. It sits as something of an ideological orphan in the debate of our times. And you've heard our eloquent speakers talk about it so far. Nobody debates that the pathway forward for most people in poverty now is equitable growth. But of course, the interesting ideological debate is around the folks who like the first word or the second word. <laughs> And so you've got the growth is good gang, and all we need to do is drive it, drive it, drive it, and don't worry, eventually people in poverty will, will, will get their fair share. And if you don't have growth, you don't get anything. And then you have the equitable growth folks who say, you know what? The growth discussion will pretty much take care of itself. Because if you look at the dynamics of how growth happens, people with a lot of power, economic power, political power, will take care of each other Growth will happen, and we, as people who care about development, should be putting our collective efforts towards the other side of the equation. It's not that they hate growth, it's just that they think it doesn't get enough attention. Some actually do hate growth, to be honest. Some even in my organization. <laughs> I mean, you got the climate gag. <laughs> anyway, OK. Um, let me not go there. But I do think there's a legitimate concern that on the equity side of the discussion, we're not putting our best creative energy towards addressing how to improve growth quality. Um, and the conversation stops there. But doing business at some level sits at something of an ideological orphan between the growth is good and the equitable growth discussion. Or at least it's not explicit enough. And I'm going to come back to that. So how does a campaigning civil society organization come to this discussion? Well, honestly, we do come out of a history which was so profoundly suspicious of elite capture both political and economic, and of this new mantra of private sector-led development, that we came to the whole discussion slowly and somewhat uh, in a cumbersome way. I don't think we were as sophisticated as we should be. I still have silly conversations with my Oxfam colleagues from around the world about the relevance of the private sector. So we just launched a campaign last week called Behind the Brands, challenging 10 food companies in an index to outperform each other in a race to the top on issues like transparency and, and other things. And there were lots of folks in my organization at the outset of this who say, why are we trying to help big food junk companies perform better? Well, guess what? They're driving the global food discussion for better or worse, and we better get our heads around it. But it's that kind of cumbersome thinking inside CSOs that has slowed down our entry into the doing business discussion. We all are coming around to the fact that in the end of the day, as you said, Randall, we are not the protagonists. We'd love to think we are. It's why often we got into the game. But it is going to be people lifting themselves out of poverty by setting up the kinds of small businesses we're talking about today, and ultimately, hopefully, paying taxes into the system, holding their governments accountable to use those taxes to deliver the kinds of public goods and services that they need to advance themselves rather than the hotel rooms that do, do nobody any good. That is the development narrative of the future. And we have to get our heads into that game. Um, there is also, what is profoundly appealing about this, the merciless logic of campaigning. Because for those folks who sit around the water cooler in the morning, what we have come to realize as civil society organizations, if the rights dimension of things is hard to put your finger on, and the love dimension of things is hard to put your finger on, that the new and interesting dynamic is this idea of comparing uh, potentially responsible actors to engage in a race to the top. Now, of course, there are, right, there are responsible actors at the heart of this, which are the national governments who will or will fail to put in place the kinds of policies that help business work better or not. But sometimes for organizations like ours, that's a challenging reality to engage with because we operate in 92 countries around the world. We get permission to respond to humanitarian crises and to do other things. 
basically because those governments tolerate us being there often. But when it comes time to hold them accountable, sometimes being honest, even a campaigning organization like Oxfam, will be tentative because the net benefit of us holding that government accountable has to be greater than the good we can do by keeping our mouths shut and just helping people. So we are looking for sophisticated ways to hold governments accountable without putting in jeopardy our ability just to do the more humble uh, and specific acts of reaching real people in real ways. And when you come up with an index like this that is comparative, it is transparent, it has this global uh, imprimatur of legitimacy from the World Bank, it helps us engage because it allows us to do that more sophisticated advocacy that says, yeah, you should be moving up the rankings uh, without uh, getting into the kinds of discussions that ultimately might undermine our ability to function at all. So that's why I'm here today to say, this is good. It's ridiculous we're having an existential crisis type discussion about the issue. But you, if you are advocates for this, should be asking yourselves why this thing is an orphan. Why doesn't it elicit more passion of one form or another? Why don't we have more champions? Why does it take Dan to get us all together at this time and say, you know there's folks trying to kill this thing. What are we going to do about it? And I do want to push you a little bit on that because I wouldn't be Oxfam and representing us fairly if I didn't. <laughs> so um, I, I do think that the organizations that are most responsible, either indirectly USAID, and thank you for your leadership on this, Andrew, and, and how you managed in, in, in indirectly and then more directly as we heard the story, and the US government more generally, and the bank more generally. The, the, the organizations that were responsible for this should be asking themselves, is there a more sophisticated way of taking sides in this discussion around development that can generate more support. At our most unsophisticated level, what organizations like ours do is we divide the world simply between sort of country, like one country versus another. The classic humanitarian rationale is we don't pick between warring party A and warring party B. We're just there to serve the innocent. But of course, what we've begun to realize is that within each of those entities, warring party A and B, there are a set of elite actors who care nothing about the victims on the ground and care only about their own enrichment. Um, that we have, as a rights-based organization, become more fluent in saying, hey, you know what? The right humanitarian action is not to say nothing uh, and, and hear nothing, but to hold those who are truly accountable more so. Um, and I think there's a corollary in the doing business world. There are a group of elites in countries that, that are challenging this whole mechanism because it hurts them, because they have their, their cousin who owns the newspaper, or they want to stay in a $6,000 hotel. And if you never name these actors, if you never actually name the sides who are winning and losing from this, if you never say, we're on the side of small businesses here, and it's the big guys who refuse to be transparent, refuse to be accountable, who will lose. If you don't name that, you lose the chance to get all of the passion that could come from your civil society engagers. So my first challenge with you would be to be more explicit about that and to help us connect the dots. The worst thing you should do if you want civil society supports is inadvertently take sides in a way you don't mean to and that will actually alienate you from us. And so here, is an example of that. There's, a, there's so many great anecdotes and stories in the report, but the one that I particularly liked was the call back to Jean-Baptiste Colbert, who was the French philosopher and minister of finance to King Louis XIV, who remarked, I don't know if you read this, I liked it, the art of taxation consists in so plucking the goose as to obtain the largest amount of feathers with the smallest am possible amount of hissing. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> And I think that is particularly appropriate in this town right now. <laughs> we are still in uh, Washington and in the United States having, in my view, precisely that conversation about taxation because the rule is if you say the words, you will somehow have either explicitly or inadvertently taken sides in a stale ideological debate. We can't even use the words redistribution without half the people walking out of the room. I wasn't using it in an ideological way. Please stay. Um, um, there, there needs to be a serious discussion around uh, 
what we are saying in the doing business indicators about the role of taxation. And here would be my challenge. When you make a statement in your taxation indicator that paying less taxes is a sign of progress, you are taking sides. And I want to know if the doing business leadership means to take sides in that discussion. That you think it's a better thing that public uh, um, resources should be diminished so that they have less funding to create the enabling environment for people to get the public goods and services through which they can start their businesses. If you make, as one of your sub-indicators, the reducing of taxes an indicator, if you tell stories about the great advance in having uh, country X, I can't remember the exact one, s s charge 2% less in taxes, you are taking sides in an ideological debate, and I don't think you should be. I think you've got it wrong. So, what I would say to the doing business folks, look, 10 indicators, we agree with pretty much all of them as an institution. There is some debate about some of them. I frankly, uh, as Oxfam America and as an individual, think that we have to, to do some more uh, harder thinking about some of those indicators, and we've frankly gotten it wrong in the past. I do think we're right about this tax issue. I do think that, uh, that the future of the development discussion, if it isn't about us, if it is about helping economies become more robust, if the real innovative flow of financing it are fiscal flows, and we've got to find a way to get that right, if we are all collectively concerned about elite capture of the wrong form, then I think we ought to be more sophisticated about this. I do think the doing business indicator needs to take another look at that. And, but in the end of the day, the biggest thing I want to say is I think you are getting it right by starting to bring this discussion into the mainstream by asking civil society to opine and give us the tools to help you in the larger cause that everybody has spoken about so far, which is helping these economies become more fair and create what is that great American idea, genuine equality of opportunity for everyone to lift themselves out of poverty. So thanks for that. Well, th <laughs> well, thanks to all three of you for your observations. And I'm, I'm going to just throw out three things that I'm hearing. Um, first, I'm, I'm kind of surprised to hear two tough guy Republicans and one soft-hearted um, CSO guy talk about doing business really in terms of how do you get the poorest people to have a better means and a better life. Because I don't think that conversation happens a lot. And I think that's what you're saying, Paul, is that we ha need to have a lot more of that passion about why is doing business sort of not just sort of a top heavy, you know, multinational company wants to come in and do well. Why, why actually is it important for poverty? And you guys have just articulated it in a very effective way, I think. Um, the second, it was just, uh, I'd like to see what your thoughts are in terms, and you, I think, have all refuted this just now, but in terms of saying that these indicators, this is a Western model. This is how sort of, you know, America and Europe operates and other countries can't be held. It's just too, not culturally sensitive. Um, and, and third, I'm going to ask the other two folks to comment on your tax uh, proposal here. If, if you three would just sort of comment on the poverty piece, the Western model, and then if you want to make a comment about Paul's tax uh, proposal, mm -hmm. that would be great. And then we'll open audience questions. Sure. Uh, well, let me, I, I actually agree half with Paul. Because I think some conservative, and I am, people don't think I'm a conservative, I am a conservative Republican, okay? I'm not a moderate Republican. If you look at my voting record in Massachusetts when I was in the state legislature for 12 years and while I was basically the finance minister, in Ma you will know what my ideology is, okay? However, the notion that poor countries can develop without any tax revenue is preposterous. And without revenue, we wouldn't have, I mean, we need an FBI. Look what's happening in Boston. No FBI? How do you fund the FBI? You have to have tax revenues. The question is not, the Republicans have badly Name, uh, badly framed this issue. The issue is the entitlement programs, which are 60% of the federal budget. That's what the problem is, and no one wants to talk about it because they're so popular. But, that's a, but, but my point here is, I agree with them half, that we cannot say cutting all taxes in all developing countries is going to result in growth. That, we know that's not true. You have to have roads, you have to have an educated citizenry, and you have to have some minimal health care system, at a minimum, because if everybody's sick, 
If there is 95 percent illiteracy, as we're finding out in southern Sudan, that's a huge problem in terms of economic growth. On the other hand, if you have confiscatory levels of taxation, particularly on business and wealthy people, they have ways of, of leaving. They just move their money elsewhere, and it's extremely destructive to business. And people find ways of going around the system, just not paying taxes. I'm a Greek American. I was I actually used the Doing Business report. You know, Greece is uh, ranked in the UNDP Human Development Index as one of the highest developed countries in the world, 19 or 20th the last time I looked. On the Doing Business Report and the Corruption Index from Transparency, it's like 60 or 70. It's not a developed country. And I said that in Athens at a big forum. It caused a little <laughs> stir. <laughs> and I said, you know, you, someone has to ask the question, what, you're asking me, I don't know anything. I'm not an expert in the Greek economy, but just look at the question, the, 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 the data here. These indexes are very useful. Why is, there are many developing countries much higher ranked in terms of the transparency index for transparency index and on the doing business report. I said, you have to ask the question, why do Greeks, in Greece, the, the, um, the word entrepreneur is a word uh, that describes thieves. <laughs> now, in the Greek, in, they've done two studies, empirical studies, of the only community that's richer in the United States than the Greek, Greek America is the Jewish community. We are the second ranked in two studies based on census tract data. Why are the Greeks rich here and in Australia and in Britain and in the rest of Europe and not in Greece? It's because of the legal system and it's because of the doing business rules. It's because the whole system is designed to, and one of the factors in Greece is they have very high levels of taxation. They do. And no one pays any taxes. It's an extremely corrupt system. I don't want to go into the details of how that works. So, I think we have, to, we have to ask the question, are confiscatory levels of taxation, the French government was talking about a 75% tax level for rich people, I mean, what is that? What do you think people are going to do? Anybody who's rich will just move all their stuff out of France, which is what they're doing. On the other hand, saying that you don't need any tax revenue to run a government is preposterous. It's preposterous here, and it's preposterous in, uh, in, in the developing world. So, I think we need to, I am not an expert and I don't want to start making recommendations, but uh, I, I, I would urge a, a more uh, nuanced view of this. Uh, I, I don't know what the right numbers are, but maybe some empirical studies on when, like Paul Collier did in his uh, bottom billion, wh where do we reach a point where the level of taxation actually does affect growth? And where, when, it's too, when there's no revenue, is there a problem? I might add the second uh, uh, bigger issue is not just the levels of taxation. It's the collection of the taxes. Either you don't collect them or they're collected in a highly erratic way so there's no, no one gets paid half the time in many bureaucracies in the developing world. And the other big problem, of course, is corruption in the tax system. It's, it's, a, it's an invitation to ex extract rents from people. And that's not what we want. Push the button. Uh, the, um, well, so, so just a few points. I mean, I don't know that I have a lot to add to that. Uh, with respect to poverty uh, and the relationship between the uh, doing business report and poverty, I mean, I, I, that's, I mean that's, that's really the whole point. I mean, for the most part, the issues that, uh, the elements that are being measured on the doing business report, I mean, so they're, they are not in any way irrelevant to large international investors, but they aren't fundamentally what's going to uh, affect those types of investment decisions. Uh, I mean, they're not irrelevant, but they're much, much more relevant for the small business person or the non-small business person who wants to become a small business person. and and the issue about uh, inefficient regulation is primarily about the, the local person who has an idea uh, or who has the energy to start something and their ability to start something. Uh, and that is what's fundamentally important to uh, private sector growth here or anywhere. Uh, and that's, and you know, that's really the issue. I mean, I think there's a very tight connection. I'm surprised that people look at this as something that's really a, a tool for 
for business as opposed to a tool for development. Uh, a Western model. I just think that's close to absurd. Um, the, I mean, you just look at the list. There are a lot of non-Western countries that do just fine on the list. If it was a Western, I mean, if there was something that was inherent in the doing business assessment process that was inconsistent with non-Western ways of being, they wouldn't be there. Um, uh, on the tax issue, oh, I, I could talk a long time about the tax issue, um, but I do think that uh, you know taxes have to be thought about uh, sensibly. Uh, it is obviously too much of a shorthand to say that always and everywhere every tax reduction is a good idea. Um, uh, on the other hand, an inefficient tax regime, which can include a high nominal rates that simply aren't being paid, is a, an invitation to corruption, which is in itself a separate but related problem for development. Uh, and so I think that a focus on tax regime, including levels of nominal taxation, is appropriate for that reason because it just, it, it is a, you know, experience shows that while it is, there's not a inevitable intellectual connection uh, between the two, there is a practical connection between uh, high levels of taxation and high levels of corruption because people are just not going to pay them. Uh, I, I, I am provoked by the very last comment that Randall made. I, I do think uh, this is about a Western model um, and I think uh, we are winning. Um, and I know that is uh, provocative, but um, I'm also a fan of Alexander Hamilton. Federalist paper number 10. That was about fundamentally regulating factionalism, creating a separation of powers, making sure that if you were going to uh, really tackle the power of elite capture, you needed to make a set of rules that everyone could live by and incentivize people to act in their own interest to live peacefully. Madison. I thought you said Hamilton. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, uh, you're absolutely right. I, am, I'm, I, I apologize, I and I need a history you lesson. No, you are absolutely right. It was Madison. So maybe we have a Madison Hamilton difference. It's absolutely true. <laughs> I remember I the too, paper. I, I, I remember the paper, and it was the. I got the author wrong, and okay. and and maybe I'm not such a fan of Mr. Hamilton. Then um, here's the. <laughs> here's, the, but 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 that was the argument. It was an argument. Look. Uh, I, one more example. Yesterday, um, we had a conversation about a land transparency index that, uh, being quite honest, we supported for some time, but uh, Oxfam China asked us to pull out of uh, because it was making evidence a set of transactions around who was getting land, who was getting pushed off land, how it was happening that many Chinese companies were uncomfortable about. Um, and they did not necessarily embrace that the best way to achieve growth is by creating a transparent set of rules of the game that, um, uh, that would ultimately benefit everyone. And I, I think we're all very keenly aware that ch some of the Chinese companies out there are doing better business, that are doing more creative things, but there is a set of ideas that is being debated around what is the foundation for good business. And I do think there are ideological di differences. And I don't actually think it's that provocative uh, a, a sentiment to share that the, w the Western model that was basically transparency has got to lead in the end of the day to citizen state accountability. And that has got in the end of the day to lead to better service provision, which creates an enabling environment for people to lift themselves from poverty is winning. That is the only serious theory of change in development right now. We can argue about who's winning more and less, and that's why I make the taxation point. But, and I want to come back to what Andrew said, because I do think he missed it. Um, but in the end of the day, the answer to your question is, uh, yes, it is a Western model. I think it doesn't help us politically, even in, for me in this room. I'm sure there are thoughtful Chinese colleagues in this room who say, you're, you're not making any friends by being explicit about it. But I think at some level, we should be transparent about the transparency discussion. On, the, uh, on this question of tax, I think the one thing that Andrew didn't say, and I think needs to be said, is look, all tax systems, uh, either by intent 
or uh, uh, somewhat inadvertently and sometimes covertly are either more or less regressive or progressive. When you fail to tax businesses and governments need to pay in an aid-diminished world for public goods and services, they're going to go somewhere. So when you take away taxation from business, where does it go? It goes as it's going right now in sub-Saharan Africa almost across the board to ever-increasing VAT on basic goods, consumer tax. That's regressive. It goes on labor. That's regressive. So you are making a choice when you say, you know what, we're going for a certain type of growth and we're not going to tax businesses. And as the doing business indicator, we're going to reward countries that lower their taxes of businesses. If you want to say, hey, I'm an ideologue who believes that that kind of growth will be better in the long run, fine. But let's be, I, my, my provocation back to you is let's be explicit about the choice we're making about how we're going to lift people from poverty. And I would say, no, you do a better job by getting a better balance, particularly in the continent that is growing fastest of all, and you don't need to incentivize corporations in the way you did 10, 15 years ago to get in there and small businesses to set up. I think now the time is to shift and start looking once again at putting a slightly bigger burden on corporations and, and medium businesses and small business and get them into the formal economy. But let's have that discussion is the point I'm making. Great. Well, thank you. And I think we have a few minutes left to take some questions. Um, Mr. Wolfowitz, you want to start out? Sorry if I'm hogging the mic, but first I have to say I came here hoping to hear Simeon talk. Uh, it's a fantastic panel. I'm really glad I got a chance to hear you. It's very, very interesting. Um, but someone once said that if you're going to change a much-loved policy, keep the old name. And if you want to keep the policy the same, change the name. And I'm, I don't believe in the suggestion I'm about to make, but it seems to me it's at least worth thinking about the fact that <laughs> the name doing business report uh, kind of suggests that the report is neutral with respect to business, and then it immediately comes to mind that somehow this is for the Exxons and Coca-Colas of the world. And of course, the truth is exactly the opposite. They have no problem, as someone pointed out, <laughs> paying $4,000 to open a Coca-Cola franchise somewhere. It's about small business, and I wonder if it somehow couldn't be called a the small business report, because it seems to me that's what it's about. Great. I'm going to ask um, for a couple more questions. Oh, Dan has a question. I'm just going to note that we hear at least once a day on the subject of the greatest Americans. Dan tells us that Andrew Nazio is, is one of the greatest Americans. So, well, it's, it's, um, forget Jefferson, forget it's Hamilton. Not, it's not bragging if it's true. It's, it, so I th it, I, I'm thrilled to have all three of you on this panel, and thank you, Joanna, for moderating this. Um, I just think this issue of tax is a particularly thorny one. I, um, I wrote about this for uh, Shadow Government, which is a Republican blog, and I was making all the positive arguments on behalf of why Republicans should, should pay attention to this issue. And I thought, okay, now am I going to put in there, oh, and they'll pay more taxes? I said, mm, maybe I'll leave that one out. So, so I know, you're right, Paul. You put your finger on something that this is not a, this is not, but I think uh, we hosted the head of the DAC here yesterday. And we had someone from the French government. And if you look at how development is going to be financed, it's not going to be ODA. It's going to be through tax revenues. UNDP said that there's been a quadrupling of tax revenue in Africa from $100 billion to $400 billion in the last 10 years. Um, I mean, compare that to how much ODA there is in Africa. Is it maybe 60, 80? I mean, it's, it's a huge number. So getting a handle on how governments collect taxes, I think there's a second argument about, OK, in some ways, it's sort of a, a conversation for within a society about, and I think there certainly, I think outside forces can make arguments about what's that, what's that level look like. It sure as hell ain't 75 percent is my is probably a probably a reasonable guess. So I think you've put your you guys have put your your finger on something that I think we we need to do a far better job on. I'm I'm just wondering. I want to put Michael Klein and maybe Juan Jose de Boob on the spot on this issue of taxes, and I'm sure you'll both thank me for putting you on the spot on this, but. Um, could you, I just, just on this issue of both, ta could you, Michael, talk to this issue as having, you know, you, you had this discussion in terms of thinking about what, what that looks like, and then Juan Jose, you are a finance minister in El Salvador, you had to think about these issues of taxes, you're in a country where some people don't want to pay their taxes or look for ways to avoid it, but I'm going to ask Michael to speak first because I know this, this is one of the indicators and there's some debate, but I think then there's some harder choices for policymakers who actually have to, to make these decisions in government in El Salvador or elsewhere, so Michael, that's okay, Joanne. Thank you. 
Okay, thanks, Dan. I'll, the way we've looked at the tax debate, and this has been there for, all of these debates have been there for 10 years. Uh, and on the tax debates, the empirical studies that have been behind this and that looked at this, and the way the indicator is designed, it's not an indicator of the tax system as a whole. It's an indicator of how complicated tax payments are made for businesses, plus what the rates are, the marginal tax rates. And when you look at the empirical evidence for the relevant empirically existing range of tax systems in the world, the overwhelming evidence shows that if you lower the nominal rate, made the payments of taxation easier, et cetera, you actually get more aggregate tax revenue. That's in most of the studies, that's, or for most of the countries, that's the evidence. So the direction in which the indicators drive uh, countries typically would give them actually more revenue overall. So this the issue of the rate versus, uh, as Randy said, but, uh, and the actual revenue. One of the intriguing facts in, in the world that comes out from doing business, which I didn't expect in this starkness, is that the marginal tax rates on business are highest in the world in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and that's also where least taxes are paid. Uh, and so it's this evasion issue that is there. That is one. So the, as this is a Republican event here, may, maybe at some level. Uh, no, no, it's not, but the, the, the word Republican, I'm German, I'm from a different place. Uh, I don't know what party I belong to. The, uh, but uh, the Laffer curve is alive and well, no? so in, in most of the world. And intriguingly, uh, as has been mentioned already, Scandinavia is ranked very high on everything. So tax systems, very extensive tax systems, which provide very extensive social safety nets, are quite compatible uh, with what doing business says. I would, uh, then there's the broader debate on whether what does an optimal tax system look like. And uh, I think, Paul, you went a little bit in that direction, arguing about the shift from business taxation to VAT, so indirect taxation. Just as a side remark, I would say in Africa, to my mind, the big issue is that uh, the, th the movement to VAT was driven by the attempt to get off trade taxes into indirect taxes more broadly imposed, not so much away from business taxes as such. And personally, my view would be, uh, this is outside the doing business scope, that the issue of progressivity is an issue of personal income tax. Uh, business tax gets passed on, uh, but progressivity you need to discuss under personal income tax debate, which is not captured. Thank you. Well, what i just like to say is that uh, in 1998, uh, when I started in government, there were 113 different taxes uh, in the country. We simplified that into three, uh, and we lowered the import duties for uh, intermediate goods and uh, uh, basic raw materials in order to motivate more investment in the country. So simplification is very important. Uh, I wanted, when I was the Minister of Finance, to actually put a flat tax but the choice was between dollarizing the economy and having a flat tax, which I think is more fair, but we, we didn't have enough political capital to do that. Uh, so simplification of the tax system and expanding the tax base uh, is key uh, for um, countries like El Salvador and others to, to, to actually to progress. And we can have a much longer conversation on, on taxes, but I think we are talking about making sure that the doing business or the small doing business uh, report uh, continues to, to guide many decision makers in the right direction. And as I said in my intervention, I have seen that uh, in over 110 countries, and it would be a shame to, uh, to lose that momentum or that dynamic. Great. Well, I think we're running out of time here. I don't know if the three of you have any closing comments you'd like to make. Uh, Douglas Norris' book, Violence and Social Orders, which is quite interesting. There's been a debate in the development community for a long time about whether government is necessary to development. And what Douglas Norris says in his book is they've done a very comprehensive analysis. They don't present all of the data in the book. I think they've published it elsewhere, which is all developed countries, wherever they are, without exception, have a dense level of government. It does not necessarily have to be centralized, however. And what they show in their studies is that there were a number of countries, Switzerland, Canada, the United States, Australia, that are, are federal systems. 
that have a much smaller government at the national level and a much more dense uh, level of government at the state and local level. And so you have highly developed countries with, like France, which has a highly centralized system, and you have, until recently, United States with a highly decentralized system where most of public services are provided at the state and local level. I think, frankly, the size of the country has required it. Running a country of this size from a central capital doesn't really make a lot of sense if you think about what we do, trash pickup and things like that. But the interesting thing is all countries without exception have, and the reason for it is that governments and nonprofit institutions and businesses that are legal, uh, this is the argument of the book, a dense, a dense level of institutions is what leads to high levels of growth, low levels of violence, and much higher levels of political stability and the protection of rights. It's very interesting that, I mean, Douglas Moore made, won the Nobel Prize for institutional economics, but in this book he goes far beyond institutional economics. This is about all kinds of institutions. And the question, of course, is how you create the institutions. That's been the debate for a long time. But I just want to add to that little debate. And you can, the conservatives are right and the liberals are right, which is the data. The da you can have a highly decentralized society, but you cannot have a government, a country with no government and have it develop. You just can't. So the laissez-faire, complete libertarian argument does not work, and there's no empirical evidence to support it. But you can take the... My view, which is that the, in the United States, in our system, and many other countries, it is much better to have these f services provided and uh, power made, uh, decision making made at the state and local level rather than the national level. You can be a liberal and be in favor of development. I'm not arguing you can't. But both positions can result in, in a highly developed society. Um, thank you. Well, first, thanks. I've really enjoyed being part of it. I felt it was a very useful and discussion and really appreciated the comments also from the audience. Uh, Dr. Wolfowitz, I hope you write ab about your idea on uh, renaming this the Small Business Report at some point. I hope others heard it. I think it's, it could be precisely the kind of idea that helps us understand, particularly those of us who understand that, uh, who, want, who are asking the question, who is this trying to help? Which side is this on? Naming it the small business report for all those who are agnostic and just hear the word business and say, oh, that's not us. I think that would really help. You know, I spoke with a small business owner yesterday, an American business, small business owner, who said, you know, there's something wrong with the fact that I pay more taxes than General Electric. It just doesn't make sense to me. And I'm talking to other small business owners, and they feel that way too, and there is a, there is a growing discussion around that. I do think comments well taken on the progressivity question, but there is this question that small businesses are asking in the United States and around the world. Of course we'll pay. Of course we want to be part of the formal economy, but we want to pay our fair share and we want to know that those who are getting the most profit from the system are, are also being progressively challenged to pay their share too, despite whatever challenges there are to the growth discussion. So just to say, I'm, I'm really glad that we had some of that debate around taxes. It does need further discussion. Um, but I think we all share a desire to side with the small business owners of this world and create the space for them to do what they do so well. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure that I would say anything as the last comment other than to reiterate that, uh, again, I think this has, you know, I, I think the reception among the consumers of data, if the World Bank wants to be sort of a, a knowledge bank as well as, uh, uh, as part of its development mission, uh, the consumers of that data, of that knowledge, of that uh, information have shown by their uh, acceptance and the attention paid to this that this is among the most successful products of that sort that the World Bank produces. It doesn't mean that it's a perfect product, uh, but it is certainly among the most successful things that the World Bank does in this area. And I just think it would be it, uh, an extraordinary decision for any organization of any sort to take one of its most successful efforts and end it. Well, thank you, all three of you, for this very thoughtful and serious discussion. And thanks to you, um, we'll clear the way, but please join me in thanking our panel. Thank, 
Thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Randy. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks. Andrew gets the, uh, the, the award for traveled the longest to be here for this, and I know you extended your travel to be, your stay to be here. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joanna. Great. Um, I, I'm going to ask, I'm gonna ask Michael, Michael Klein to come up and just say a few words. He's going to join us for a panel, but really, Michael was present at the creation and provided the bureaucratic political cover, but also the thought leadership as vice president for the private sector division at, at the World Bank Group when this was going on and has been really a, uh, a real partner to me in this process. So I'm going to ask Michael to make a few words from the podium. Uh, and uh, I'm going to, Michael, please come up to the podium and, and make a few words, if you would. And then we'll, we're going to be having a break right after that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Press the button, right? Yeah. Thank you, Dan. And uh, just a few remarks. So. I was the vice president or the director at the time in the World Bank when the Doing Business Report was launched. I didn't invent it. I was the venture capitalist, if you like. Uh, Simeon came with the idea. Uh, I funded it uh, and supported it. And in the light of the discussion, let me just make a few generic points. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about the engine room of doing business, where there are lots of detail that one needs to understand to be on top of all the debates, uh, but uh, some broad points. First of all, what is the report fundamentally all about? It's, on, it's about success on the basis of rules and not on the basis of connections. And if there is one person in some sense that may be looked upon as expressing the, the very nature of the issues, it's Mohamed Bouazizi, who, as you may recall, uh, inf put himself uh, in flames and, uh, and triggered the Arab Spring. Uh, that was one of the street vendors that were push, pushed outside the formal system, subject to harassment, etc., where rules were abused uh, to, to hurt him. Uh, and it's the plight of people like that that the Doing Business Report tries to address. Uh, it's the people who are being pushed into informality, as has been put before, uh, and who have not a chance uh, to be successful on the same basic rule playing field as others. That is what it is about. It's not about helping big business particularly or any particular uh, part of society otherwise or promoting a neoliberal agenda or whatever it is. It is about success on the basis of rules. And when we look at how countries have actually acted as long as this can be tracked, and it's the first time that we actually can track what countries do with this agenda for the last 10 years, it is intriguing to see that out of the 185 countries that are now covered by the report, only two have somewhat systematically undertaken policies that go in a direction not compatible with an improvement in the doing business rankings. And those are, surprise, surprise, Venezuela and Zimbabwe. Uh, everybody else in the world, uh, every government de facto agrees with the agenda and is making steps, bigger or smaller, uh, to help improve things in that direction. And that includes a lot of countries in Africa. Uh, some of the African Renaissance is underpinned by these regulatory efforts in Eastern Europe, in the OECD countries. It includes countries such as China, which has been a significant reformer uh, over the 10 years uh, that we track data on. Uh, it includes France and the OECD. So whatever official positions might be, et cetera, the revealed preference of pretty much every government in the world is that this agenda makes sense. And the only question is uh, how to bring that uh, out and clearly keep measuring that. The second thing is, and I'm elaborating a little bit about some points which have already been made, it is not about helping incumbent businesses strengthen their position. It is about opening up the playing field, uh, opening up for new entrants, uh, for new challengers, etc. And there are some interesting anecdotes about that. Mexico provides one where the Mexican government a few years back tried to pass a new securities law uh, and it tried to improve financial sector regulation, uh, make the market more transparent, protect investors better, etc. So a lot more new regulation, which doing business uh, supported. And they used the doing business report to demonstrate to parliamentarians that if an opposition proposal went through, it would actually deteriorate the rankings, whereas the government proposal would improve them. 
and the opposition proposal was promoted by an incumbent player who didn't want the market positions to be challenged. Uh, and so this was a case where the doing business report was used by a government not only to make more rules and more regulations, so it's not a deregulation agenda per se, but a regulation that improves protection for investors, puts everybody on playing fields, allows new entry into the market. And uh, as Greece has been mentioned before in that context, uh, here's another tiny little anecdote. A few years back, before the financial crisis erupted, we were called by some bureaucrats in the government of, of Greece to have a look at what we could do about promoting doing business type reforms, because there were some who wanted to do that within Greece. And one of the examples which was striking uh, of the, uh, give you a flavor of what the rules encapsula encapsulate, is the rules in Greece for business registration. So here, uh, this is when you normally talk to governments and say, here you have a complicated set of rules, uh, like Andrew Natsios mentioned with uh, Mr. Mellis in Ethiopia, and if you really demonstrate that the rules are not very helpful, etc., most governments say, okay, it's good. It's po politically popular to help small business businesses, etc. It's often an administrative um, act that can make things better, etc. But in Greece, that was not possible. Why? Because it was a complicated system of setting up enterprises with lots of processes, and at many steps, fees were collected. And the fees were funding the pension fund of the lawyers in Greece. Uh, and so the lawyers, of course, are well represented in parliament, etc. So the people who had to undo the system would undo their own pension system. Uh, and so that did not happen. It was almost impossible and to this day has not quite happened, although it's on the agenda right now again. So this is an, as an example that doing business is not there uh, to protect existing power positions, but on the contrary, to open up the field for everybody on an equal playing field, small businesses in particular. And then, has been mentioned already, ten, Scandinavian countries are top rated. All the Scandinavian countries, either civil law countries, so there is no particular issue to this debate about uh, civil versus uh, common law that uh, unfortunately from time to time creeps into this. Civil law countries can do just as well as anybody else. Scandinavian countries are one of the uh, sets of examples that show that. They show how you can, how the very basic point makes sense of having a, a business environment that generates growth that allows you to fund uh, a sensible safety net. So this is what uh, we de facto see around the world. And then when it comes to uh, the point that Randy Quarles mentioned about how do investors look at this and what is, does it mean for investors? And would investors, for example, look at all countries, rank them from one to 185 and draw the line somewhere, what was he saying, 68 or, or whatever the number might be? Actually, most investors wouldn't look at that and if they did, uh, they would lose money. Uh, because the, the basic investment hypothesis that from the time in the World Bank Group, in the IFC, the private sector arm, as well as lots of private equity houses uh, that you would have in your mind is distinguish three investment situations in the world. You have a country or a company that is lousy and that is not going to improve, which makes no effort to improve. Is that a good investment uh, object? Probably not. Then there are countries that are actually in great shape or companies that are in great shape and it's easy to operate, easy to invest. Is that a good investment opportunity? Yeah, that might be something, but it gives you limited upside. The real thing, the real prize is to find a country or a company that is currently not doing so well, but it is willing to improve and that is making efforts and figuring out that, that is the big prize. And so it's the reform effort, not the absolute ranking, that matters for countries getting ahead, for attracting both domestic as well as foreign investment, even though doing business only talks about domestic investment. And that is what we see in the numbers uh, and in the analyses. So altogether, once again, sort of the basic message is success on the basis of rules is a policy and program of economic inclusion.